A Patriot's History of the United States Chapter 3 Colonies No More 1763 to 1783 Farmers and Firebrands The changes brought by the French and Indian War were momentous, certainly in the sheer size and unique character of the territory involved. Historian Francis Parkman maintained that the fall of Quebec began the history of the United States. British acquisition of the new territories carried a substantial cost for almost every party involved. England amassed huge debts, concluding in the process that the colonists had not paid their fair share. France likewise emerged from the war with horrific liabilities. Half the French annual budget went to pay interest on the wartime debt, not to mention the loss of vast territories. Some Indian tribes lost lands or were destroyed. Only the American colonists really came out of the Seven Years' War of Combat as winners. Yet few saw the situation in that light. Those Indians who allied with the French lost substantially. Only the Iroquois, who supported the British in form but not substance, emerged from the war as well as they had entered it. Immediately after the war, pressure increased on the tribes in the Appalachian region as settlers and traders appeared in ever-increasing numbers. An alliance of tribes under the Ottawa chief of Pontiac mounted a stiff resistance, enticing the Iroquois to abandon the British and join the new confederacy. Fearing a full-blown uprising, England established a policy prohibiting new settlers and trading charters beyond a line drawn through the Appalachians known as the Proclamation Line of 1763. There was more behind the creation of the line than concern about the settlers' safety, however. Traders who held charters before the war contended they possessed monopoly powers over trade in their region by virtue of their charters. They sought protection from new competitors who challenged the existing legal status of the charters themselves. Such concerns did not interest the Indians, who saw no immediate benefit from the establishment of the line. Whites continued to pour across the boundary in defiance of the edict, and in May 1763, Pontiac directed a large-scale infiltration and attack of numerous forts across the northern frontier, capturing all but Detroit and Fort Pitt. English forces regrouped under General Jeffrey Amherst, defeating Pontiac and breaking the back of the Indian Confederacy. Subsequent treaties pushed the Indians further west, demonstrating both the Indians' growing realization that they could not resist the English on the one hand, or believe their promises on the other. Paradoxically, though, the benefits of the English saved the Indians from total extermination, which in earlier eras, as with the Mongol or Assyrian empires, or under circumstances, as in the aftermath of King Philip's War, would have been complete. As early as 1763, a pattern took shape in which the British, and later the Americans, sought a middle ground of Indian relations in which the tribes could be preserved as independent entities, yet sufficiently segregated outside white culture or society. Such an approach was neither practical nor desirable in a modernizing society, and ultimately the strategy produced a pathetic condition of servitude that ensnared the Indians on reservations rather than forced an early commitment to assimilation. Timeline 1763, the Proclamation of 1763 1765, Stamp Act and Protest 1770, Boston Massacre. 1773, Tea Act and Boston Tea Party. 1774, Intolerable Acts, First Continental Congress. 1775, Battle of Lexington and Concord, Washington appointed Commander-in-Chief. 1776, Thomas Paine's Common Sense. Declaration of Independence. 1777. Articles of Confederation. Battle of Saratoga. 
1778. The French Alliance. 1781. Articles of Confederation ratified. Cornwallis surrenders at Yorktown. 1783. The Treaty of Paris. Land Regulation and Revolution. By establishing the Proclamation Line, the British not only disturbed aspiring traders and disappointed the besieged Indians, but also alienated many of the new settlers in the West. After all, many had come to the New World on the promise of available land, and suddenly they found it occupied by what they considered a primitive and barbarous people. Some settlers simply broke the law moving beyond the line. Others, including George Washington, an established frontiersman and military officer who thought westward expansion a foregone conclusion, groused privately. Still others increasingly used the political process to try to influence government with some mild success. The Paxton Boys Movement of 1763 in Pennsylvania and the 1771 Regulator Movement in North Carolina both reflected the pressures on new residents in the western areas to defend themselves, despite high taxes they paid to the colonial government, much of which was supposed to support defense. Westerners came to view taxes not as inherently unfair, but as oppressive burdens when incorrectly used. Westward expansion only promised to aggravate matters. In 1774, Lord Dunsmore of Virginia defeated Indians in the Kanawha River Valley, opening the trails of Kentucky to settlement. The white Indian encounter, traditionally described as Europeans stealing land from Native Americans, was in reality a much more complex exchange. Most, but certainly not all, Indian tribes rejected the European view of property rights, wherein land could be privatized. Rather, most Indians viewed people as incapable of owning the land, creating a strong incentive for tribal leaders to trade something they could not possess for goods that they could obtain. Chiefs often were as guilty as greedy whites in thinking they had pulled a fast one on their negotiating partners, and more than a few Indians were stunned to find the land actually being closed off in the aftermath of a treaty. Both sides operated out of misunderstandings and misperceptions. Under such different worldviews, conflict was inevitable and could have proved far bloodier than it ultimately was if not for the temperance provided by Christianity and English concepts of humanity, even for barbarian enemies. Tribes such as the Cherokee, realizing they could not stem the tide of English colonists, sold their land between the Kentucky and Cumberland rivers to the Transylvania Company, which sent an expedition under Daniel Boone to explore the region. Boone, a natural woodsman of exceptional courage and self-reliance, proved ideal for the job. Clearing roads despite occasional Indian attacks, Boone's party pressed on, establishing a fort called Boonesboro in 1775. Threats from the natives did not abate, however, reinforcing Westerners' claims that taxes sent to English colonial governments for defense simply were wasted. Had Westerners constituted the only group unhappy with British government, it is unlikely any revolutionary movement would have appeared much less survived. Another more important group was needed to make a revolution. Merchants, elites, and intellectuals in the major cities or the gentlemen farmers from Virginia and the Carolinas. Those segments of society had the means, money, and education to give discontent a structure and to translate emotions into a cohesive set of grievances. They dominated the colonial assemblies and included James Otis, Samuel Adams, and Patrick Henry, men of extraordinary oratorical skills who made up the shock troops of the revolutionary movement. Changes in the enforcement and direction of the Navigation Acts pushed the eastern merchants and large landowners into an alliance with the Westerners. Prior to 1763, American merchant interests had accepted regulation by the mercantilist system as a reasonable way to gain market advantage for American products within the British Empire. 
American tobacco, for example, had a monopoly within the English markets, and Britain paid bounties, subsidies, to American shipbuilders. A policy that resulted in one-third of all British vessels engaged in Atlantic trade in 1775 being constructed in North America, mostly New England shipyards. Although, in theory, Americans were prohibited from manufacturing finished goods, a number of American ironworks, blast furnaces, and other iron supplies competed in the world market, providing one-seventh of the world's iron supplies, and flirted with the production of finished items. Added to those advantages, American colonists who engaged in trade did so with absolute confidence that the Royal Navy secured the seas. England's 800 ships and 70,000 sailors provided as much safety from piracy as could be expected, and the powerful overall trading position of Britain created or expanded markets that, under other conditions, would be denied the American colonies. As was often the case, however, the privileges that were withheld and not those granted aroused the most passion. Colonists already had weakened imperial authority in their challenge to the writs of assistance during the French and Indian War. Designed to empower customs officials with additional search and seizure authority to counteract smuggling under the Molasses Act of 1733, the writs allowed an agent of the crown to enter a house or board a ship to search for taxable or smuggled goods. Violations of the sanctity of English homes were disliked but tolerated until 1760, when the opportunity presented itself to contest the issue of any new writs. Led by James Otis, the counsel for the Boston Merchants Association, the writs were assailed as against the Constitution and void. Even after the writs themselves became dormant, colonial orators used them as a basis in English law to lay the groundwork for independence. Only two years after Otis disputed the writs in Massachusetts, Virginia lawyer Patrick Henry won a stunning victory against the established Anglican Church and, in essence, managed to annul an act of the Privy Council related to tobacco taxes in Virginia. Henry and Otis, therefore, emerged as firebrands who successfully undercut the authority of the crown in America. Other voices were equally important. Benjamin Franklin, the sage of Philadelphia, had already argued that he saw in the system of customs now being exacted in America by the Act of Parliament the seed sown of a total disunion of the two countries. And we'll pause here and continue in the next video. Please reach down, click like, subscribe to the channel, and leave a comment. I'd love to hear from you. I love you guys, as Tigger says. Ta-ta for now.